This is doing that. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good to see you. And uh, I'm going to sit here so I can push the button for our choruses. And uh, I hope that you're all doing well tonight. Welcome to everyone that's here. We just had a little bit of fun with youth hour with the uh, young ladies. We did some creative drawing. Everybody took turns drawing a part of a, well, it was supposed to be people. They turned into some sort of creatures. And uh, we learned about people, what was their favorite animals and snacks and all that. So it was good. We had a nice time. And uh, we're glad that you've joined us tonight for our Bible study time. We're going to see a couple choruses. And then uh, we're going to introduce our guest preacher for tonight. We've got Pastor Jake Leckerman from Emmanuel, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Dryden, Ontario. I almost got my... The names confused, so we're looking forward to hearing from him tonight. So we'll introduce you to him in a few minutes. But uh, first of all, let's have a word of prayer, and we will uh, ask the Lord to help us please Him this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to uh, gather together in the middle of the week, and I pray that as we sing a couple of choruses, that the words of them will help us to think uh, about you and what we need to learn from the scriptures tonight. Thank you for Pastor Leckman being willing to take time from his day uh, to meet with us tonight. And we thank you for the technology that makes this possible. I pray that you'd help everything to run smoothly tonight and uh, that you would encourage our hearts and help us. Thank you for this opportunity. Help us to please you and uh, work in our hearts tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a song for the kids. First of all, Deep and Wide. So we can get some action, some blood flowing. We'll sing Deep and Wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. Look at those backwards. Wide and deep, wide and deep, there's a fountain. 
Sing to the Lord. <clears throat> it's there somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure where it is in the list. Well, 
thank you so much for joining me in and singing. Kaylin and Levi really got into the singing tonight. That was entertaining. Good job. And thank you, Sarah, for playing. And uh, I'm going to get out of here. And if I can get this to cooperate. We'll bring in our guest preacher for tonight. There he is. How you doing, Pastor Leckerman? Good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Can you see us and hear us? I can see you. Nobody else. Okay. And I can only hear you. Well, that's that's good enough. Some of the other <laughs> ones are a bit rowdy at times. So. When you... <laughs> oh, I hear. Yeah, the little ones too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, uh, Kalen is, uh, we've been trying to sing some of the Sunday school songs in our services uh, just so the little ones learn it. We got some, our, we have little ones and some other families have little ones. So, yeah. uh, but Kalen is really getting into the music. She's only, I think she's 15 months old now. But uh, Amy usually ends up holding her while we're singing and Sarah's playing the piano and you really got to hang on to her because <laughs> she gets into it. But, uh, well, it's good to see them enjoying it. Hey, I want to thank you for taking time to do this. Uh, My honor. We've we've been enjoying the last few weeks of bringing in some of our supporting pastors, and uh, your church has supported our family in this church for longer than we've been here. Uh, your church began supporting us before we even got here. Oh, okay. And uh, we've been here over 17 years now, and you've been faithful, and uh, we really appreciate it. And we had the opportunity to come up there a number of years ago. Uh, yeah. Our family came up for a missions conference, I believe. Yes. We actually, we saw pictures of that recently because we were at uh, someone's house eating and deer came into the backyard and uh, it was, uh, we had, we really enjoyed that trip. So, yeah. Yeah. And we've known each other since. 94. Really? Yes. Seems longer. I mean, <laughs> We we met in Bible college. Uh, yes, we did. It was your yeah. second year. It was my first year. Yeah, we spent a few years together in Bible college, and we've been friends ever since. And uh, that's uh, real good. And I, I, how long have you been at uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Dryden? Uh, nine, 18 and a half years. And you've been the pastor there for? Uh, 16, just over 16 years. Wow. That's pretty good. Um, someone, oh, my wife commented, we've known each other since kindergarten. That's how young we are. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, uh, actually, my wife and your wife. Ah, yes. That's it. They've yeah. known each other longer than, than uh, we've known each other. They uh, they were in kindergarten together. So, yeah. um, so uh, give us a little idea where Dryden is. Some people may not know where Dryden in Ontario is. Do most folks know where Winnipeg is? I do. No. No. <laughs> Winnipeg, Winnipeg is, I think it's a longitude or whatever. It's almost the center of Canada. So look for pretty much the center of Canada, and we're four hours east of that. And so the north, so think of Ontario like a comma, and we're at the, we're at the top part of the comma. Oh, okay. So I to go from, from Marystown, well, minus the ferry. I suppose the ferry, right? But anyways, the drive from where I live, the drive to get to St. John's would be about 44 hours. Wow. How far north of Toronto are you? Like, what? How long does it take you to get down to Toronto? 22, 23 hours. Wow. And, and it takes you that long to get from Toronto to here if you're just driving. Take out the ferry ride. Right. Take, well, it takes you that long to get to the island. Then you still got to get across the island. Yes. Yes. So you can get you can get from Toronto to Florida in the same amount of time as from Toronto to Ontario. And we're still in the same province. Wow. That's a long ways. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I've, I've said this to every preacher we've had over the last little while. If I had asked you a couple of months ago to say, hey, would you sit in your office and preach to us? It would have seemed like a weird question. Yes. Uh, but we, we all got used to talking to computer screens <laughs> and cameras. And uh, I am taking full advantage of this. I've really enjoyed having some guest preachers. And uh, so I'm going to shut off my side of the screen and okay. you can preach to us. And when you're done, when you close in prayer, I'll come back on and we'll have a little chat then. So you good with that? I am great with that. All right. Well, I'm going to turn off mine and it's all you. Okay. 
Well, uh, hello to everyone at Heritage Baptist Church. Uh, it's uh, it has been a pleasure to get to know to be friends with Boyd and Sarah for the length of time we have, and of course, being half a country apart. We were really hoping to get to visit with you as a church this year. Um, Pastor Stanford had asked me to be the preacher this year for camp, and of uh, and of course, with how things have turned out. Um, uh, it's uh, of course not been possible, but we actually want to bring our whole family uh, out to Newfoundland. We've taken our family to uh, British Columbia, so as far as into side of, inside of British Columbia, not to the coast, but we are really hoping uh, to get to Newfoundland this year. We're planning for that and uh, preparing. So I'll just do a quick run of my family. Uh, Sarah, of course, Mrs. Stansford knows my wife, Jenny. Uh, main name was Mullet, and uh, uh, mostly from Faithway years. Uh, there and um, my oldest son is 19. His name's Seth, and he's about uh, six foot three now. I think uh, he loves to tower over top of me. And then Ebony Rose, our oldest daughter, is 16, and she's about my height. And just got her able to drive in March, so she is loving chauffeuring me around. Uh, Peter's 15 years old, and then Jordan is uh, 13 years old, and our youngest daughter, Arabella, is uh, 10. Uh, so we, God has given us a great family, and so we've had the privilege to support the Stansfords there in Newfoundland, and, and we wanted to support uh, at least one person in every province, and I believe we um, support, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else from Newfoundland, but uh, we uh, uh, did the Alcots, and I forget who else, and uh, so uh, it's been a great pleasure to get to know you, and uh, well, as far as the church, way back, I forget when it was I was there last. And so we we're hoping to bring our family. So, uh, but anyways, it's been a, an honor to support the Stansfords all this time and just been praying for them and seeing the growth has been exciting. So uh, tonight I want to look at just uh, for a few moments, I'm going to take a four or five week series I did and condense it into 20 minutes if I can do that, if it's possible. And uh, my church has reminded me a few times they love it when I first started preaching because I could do everything in 15 minutes. So I was done preaching and we could go. So now, it's a little more closer to 45 minutes if, if I don't pay attention almost an hour. So I will not do that to you this evening, but uh, it's a great honor to do this. And thank you, Pastor Stanford, for the uh, for the invite. So it is true. Preaching out of my office would it really at the beginning of all this felt really weird or from my home or uh, and so on. But it seems to be the new normal now. But I've been looking at uh, and just contemplating uh myself as well at the at the christian life and the life that the lord has called us to live um i don't believe for a moment as we look at god's word and as what we are called to that we are to be spiritual couch potatoes can i say it that way um uh, god doesn't have some of us to do some things and others well just to kind of hang around and wait until we get to see him in his presence so my personal uh, stand on this is that God has called each one of us to minister. I was looking this last Sunday, uh, Sunday evening, this past Sunday evening, at the motivations for soul winners, and God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. Pretty amazing, as we think. He uses us as the vessels, as instruments, to point others to Christ and to see through salvation that person reconciled to the Lord. And so, as we look at our life, and I was contemplating this, so uh, I'm I titled this "The Balanced Christian Life." This is again just a synopsis, but just to drive some points home, uh, people can be prone to exaggerations, right? Um, at least I find that for myself. I can exaggerate. So my wife the other day was commenting on my speed of which I traveled down a gravel road, and uh, my first reaction was to reduce the speed dramatically to almost a crawling pace. And I caught myself in that exaggeration point, right? So Christians as well in our spiritual life, we can have prones to exaggeration. We can go all out and serve God one week or one month. And then the next, you know, two months down the road, we kind of fizzle out and we do barely anything and so on. And we can have all points of, of where we're out of balance. And just like a tire out of balance, it creates, uh, well, at least on a vehicle, we notice it. It creates vibration. It creates things out of sync. And so I just, it was just four things I jotted down as we look at a balanced Christian life. And I believe the Lord says it well in Matthew, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And if we look at 
um, the Bible, if we look at what God says as do's and don'ts and so on, and we can we can be prone to exaggeration, we can get out of, out of balance and, and things start getting out of sync and so on. And I don't believe that God has intended for the life he's called us to live as his children to be one of difficulty in the sense of uh, so overweight and burdened um, that it's that it's so discouraging to live for the Lord. There will be times of difficult. James talks about counter all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. There will be difficulties and so on, but living a life that is balanced. So let's let's just uh, start right in here. So first point I want to bring up is as we look at a balanced Christian life, I believe one word that we can put in here is dedication. Now, First Corinthians chapter three and in First Corinthians chapter six are the first two references I want to turn there to. So as we look at our lives, our lives are not our own. Peter mentions that we are bought with the precious blood of Christ. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if I can read verse 16 for you, it states this, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So here Paul asks the believers, the Corinthian believers, a question. Now he's going to almost echo that again in chapter number 6, if you would turn there. So he, he asks them, Do, don't you know? that you are the temple of God. So in Corinth, there are a number of temples dedicated to all kinds of gods. And so the people there were very familiar with temples and what the purpose of them was. It was, they were set aside, they were dedicated to a particular God or gods. And so Paul saying, not saying that you are in control of God, but letting them know that you are, sanctified, you are set apart, you are dedicated to the Lord. Don't you know, Paul asked them in chapter three, that you are the temple of God. Now, if you look at chapter six, again, toward at the end of the chapter there, verse 19, he asked them what, almost like a, uh, I pictured it almost like a, a surprising rhetorical question. What? Know ye not that your temp, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? So Ephesians tells us, uh, that the Holy Spirit was given as an earnest as a payment, a down payment for our salvation until the redemption of this body. So Paul says again, you are the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost. The, the Spirit dwells within us, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are dedicated, sanctified, or set apart for the Spirit, for the, for God. Verse 20 tells us why. For ye are bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So our spirit and our body, which are God's, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. As we think of a balanced Christian life, first word of ded is dedication. So Jesus said very well that I cannot serve. You cannot serve two masters. I uh, will love the one, hate the other, hold to the one, despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon, as he calls it. So we are to be dedicated. So, and which we'll look at here in just a moment, we cannot be dedicated to ourselves and dedicated to the Lord. So I believe Psalm 1, you can interject that here, uh, as he talks about, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But the interjection there is, his delight or her delight is in the law of the Lord, which he doth meditate in day and night. So we find, as Jesus well said, we can't have two gods. God desires to be the ruler, the, the, uh, the one who has first place, and rightly so, because of the purchase redemption that we are. So first of all, dedication. My, I am to understand that I am set apart. I am sanctified or dedicated for God. I am the temple of the Holy Ghost. I am the temple of God. And so therefore, what I do, as Paul says in verse 20 of chapter 6, therefore, because of that, because I'm the temple, because I've been bought with a precious price, therefore, I should glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. Now, it comes, I say this respectfully, it comes very simple. If I am set to glorify God in everything I do. It takes me, my self, I, out of the equation. And continue, Lord, what would glorify you? What would honor you in this? I'm about to watch something on TV. I'm about to pick up some reading material. I'm about to engage in a conversation. 
And as much as we understand and in, in moving forward, Lord, will this honor you? Would this be something that would please you? I am your temple. Your spirit dwells within me. And so we find dedication and dedication to the Lord and not living a life unto myself. Paul said, the life in which I now live, I live, yet not I. I live by the faith of the Son of God, but the end yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. So Paul's saying, I'm living, but it's not my it's not my life. It's Christ's life. I've given it to the Lord. So second of all, we find discipline. Romans chapter six, one of my favorite books in all the Bible is the book of Romans. Um, it used to terrify me. I tell my church people this all the time. It used to terrify me because doctrine, I used to think of doctrine as something that was, you know, really dry and drawn out. And you had to have an IQ of 2000, you know, slight exaggeration. There I go. Uh, you know, great IQ. And uh, it, it, it scared me. And I thought, well, one of these times, you know, I'd read through like, Ugh. so I decided what better way to go through it than I started preaching through it. And wow. What a wonderful, amazing uh, uh, book that God has given to us in the scriptures. And uh, doctrine now, doctrine simply means teaching. Doctrine now is something that, that I enjoy and where we get our foundation. If we don't have our doctrine right, everything we build upon that uh, will, won't have a great uh, foundation, right? A great stand. So Romans chapter 6, a bit lengthy here. I, I marked down pretty much the entire chapter. I may not get through it, but here we find discipline. When we think of athletes, we think of those who are disciplined, um, whether it's a swimming sport or running sport, um, whether it's a, even a driving sport, they say that even uh, race car drivers have to be fit and those endurance ones, bicycling, doesn't matter what. Someone who is pressed, set to win a great reward far as in games so let's take the olympics for an example you know someone can't just apply to be for the olympics and then you know be on the couch for three and a half years jump up you know one month before and practice a few times and get to the olympics there's a discipline they discipline to to maybe uh not eat certain foods or to take time that could have been you know set for something that didn't help them for it and, and set that time aside saying no i'm gonna let this go i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, practice another hour instead of going or two hours instead of going to watch a movie or something. So they, they've learned to live a life of discipline. And we so as believers, yes, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Yes, God gives us strength to live a life that is holy, but there is a requirement on our part. I want you to look at Romans chapter six, and uh, we're going to start at verse number uh, six, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Here's where it comes in, okay? Now, saying, well, you know, the phrase devil made me do it, or I just couldn't help myself. Really, when it comes down to it, those are just things that we blame so that we don't say, yes, I made the choice to yield to that temptation, or I did. Now, as we look at this, what is Paul saying here in Romans is that what Christ has done, that we should not serve sin. I don't have to serve sin. I don't have to yield to temptation. Sin has no more dominion over me. Now, what we find in our discipline in our in our Christian life is what we will serve, and and the level of discipline will dictate uh, a lot in our relationship with the Lord. Right. So we can be a religious in in our act and so on, uh, but the Christian life is more than just doing things. I believe God ultimately wants a personal, close relationship with us. It's more than just do what I say. And though God tells us if you do these things, he will bless us. But it's more from a relationship point of view. God wants our relationship with him to grow. And as we grow in our relationship, we learn to love him. We know him more. And that deepens in it. And it gets more intimate, more innermost, innermost part. And, and we just grow, draw closer to the Lord. It's and, and we want to serve him. We, our love for him grows, and therefore we want to please him. So let's continue on reading here. Verse number seven, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Not talking about the resurrection, right? Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, sin hath no more dominion over him. Here's the groundwork that's being laid, right? Although death Christ uh, yielded himself. He submitted himself to death for the purpose of our redemption. 
Verse 10, for that in he died, he died unto sin once, and that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So he's, Paul's giving us this picture, and now we see in verse number 11, likewise, reckon ye yourselves also be, to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, he's going to go into the practical application of this. Verse number 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Okay, so let not sin, you having the choice, let not sin, therefore, because of the example he gave with Christ, sin has no more, he does, he's only died once. So because of that, uh, let not sin, therefore, reign, have dominion, have control, that you should obey it and the lusts are up. So what is this verse saying? It's saying that if sin reigns in my mortal body, meaning this, not that sin, I'm perfect and never sin again after a Christian, that's not what he's saying. But when I deliberately choose to let sin, habitual sin in my life, okay? So let's take, for example, um, ungodly thinking. If I just let my, my mind wander and going into places and wander places it shouldn't and have no discipline to say, no, that is not godly thinking. That's not renewing my mind. I'm letting my mind go. Paul's saying, I don't have to let my mind go there, right? Sin doesn't have dominion. It doesn't have control over me. Let's continue on. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. The word yield means to give place to. I was mentioning my 16-year-old learning to drive. Um, it certainly does uh, increase prayer life. <laughs> I say that jokingly because I've said it to her before. So when I'm teaching her to yield is showing who has the right of way and who is the one who has to give place to. So if I were on the merge or the yield section, and there's other traffic, they have the right of way, right? So neither yield your members. I have a choice whether I will yield my members, my body, what I do as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So he says, don't do that, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 14, beautiful verse here. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Sin does not have dominion, shall not. Okay, so verse uh, 16 then, know, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or, uh, or of obedience unto righteousness. So when I choose to yield and I say, you know what, I, I'm tired of, of, of disciplining, of being disciplined and, and, and doing right and living right and watching my, guarding my eyes and guarding my ears and guarding my mind. I'm tired of doing it and I'm just gonna give in. So I'm choosing to yield to sin or I can yield myself as a member of instrument of, of righteousness to God, which means what? Discipline. Um, I'm disciplining myself. So as we look at balance, there's times where we have to be disciplined. It's holiness is not going to come by accident. Living a life that honors the Lord doesn't come by accident. It takes work. It takes discipline. It takes dedication. I am a sanctified vessel, a vessel that is set apart, dedicated to the Lord. And I need to be disciplined in my walk with God, not being lazy. Remember the church of Revelation uh, chapter 3, I believe, Laodicea. Lay, lay the they're lukewarm. They're just apathetic. So they were, no, they were not disciplined in anything. God said, I wish you were hot or cold, right? So as we look at discipline, I need to, in Romans chapter 6, has been a chapter that I've gone to and I've gone to and look at and say, okay, who am I yielding myself to? Am I disciplined, spiritually disciplined in this area? So sometimes it's, okay, you know what? I like to enjoy uh, maybe a show. Uh, I'm going to, instead of that, I'm going to take extra time to get into God's word uh, and just and just take my time and read through a portion of scripture or take extra time to prayer instead of, uh, you know, doing something. Not necessarily wrong, but say, you know what? What would be more beneficial at this time? What would be more fruitful in this time would be to have a little extra time for the Lord. Number three would be dependence. Galatians chapter five, wonderful, wonderful verse here. The Lord just opened this to me and my eyes to this, and I have enjoyed this because um, as, as looking at a life to live for the Lord and honoring for the Lord, I would work so hard. Now, if you read Galatians five, 
toward the end there, uh, we find, well, in the middle there, verse, uh, um, oh, verse number 19 through verse number 21, we find the works of the flesh, the manifestation of the flesh. Here's how the flesh and the and the works of the flesh are manifest. And then we've got verse 22 and 23, we have the fruit of the spirit. So what I used to do is focus on the fruit of the you know spirit, trying to produce joy, trying to produce peace, and trying to produce long suffering. And I can't I can't have those things of sin manifested in my life. Excuse me. And what I was trying to do was what the Holy Spirit's job is. Now, when I say dependency or a dependence, dependence is an attitude, right? I choose to yield. My attitude, I, I need to uh, be dependent. You know, children like to be independent, right? You see them from youngsters uh, growing up, pastor, of course, anybody who has a family knows. Um, they like to show some, more, some sort of independence. And, and we do encourage that, you know. Um, it would be very disturbing if I still had to spoon feed my 19-year-old, right? Uh, my my 13 year old though some days the way he uh, spills food everywhere I just huh, I want to put a bib on the boy and feed him myself you know it just it just seems to happen you know and uh, you know where which place setting he was sitting at the table now we want them to earn or achieve some sort of independence in certain areas but as we look at the Christian life God is never intended for us to live it in our own strength he didn't say, you know, when we become his child, hey, it's great to have you part of my family. Uh, good luck until you, until you get to heaven. You know, hope you make it. No, what, what he desires is that we are fully dependent upon his strength, fully dependent upon his wisdom. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not, don't depend on your own wisdom. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. In every area in my life, I need to acknowledge God. Lord, what do you want me to do this area? And he shall direct thy path. There's a promise. I should not lean to my own understanding. My heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Trust, uh, trust in the Lord with all thy, with uh, mine. Lean on in thine own understanding. In all thy ways, in every area of my life, I do acknowledge him. And what does he promise? He will direct my path. I need God's strength. I need God's wisdom. So look at look at Galatians chapter 5 and look at verse number 16. Here I used to focus on not doing sins and trying to produce all this stuff in my life where we have in verse 16, this I say then, Paul's talking about liberty in this chapter, this I say then, walk in the spirit. Now this may seem like an obvious thing to you, but man, when the Lord showed this to me, I just about got excited, right? This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Wow. What an amazing thing. The Lord's showing you, hey, son, listen, you're trying so hard to do something that's my job, and you're focusing on the wrong thing. Just focus on walking in the spirit, living a life that honors me. So my job is not to produce the fruit there. I believe it's uh, John chapter 15. Jesus said, I'm the vine. My father's the husbandman. He is the true vine. We are the branches. The branches don't produce. The branches bear the fruit that the vine produces. So what's the Holy Spirit endeavoring to produce in my life? Well, the fruits of the Spirit in verse 22 and 23. That's his job. His job is to produce. I'm simp My job is to bear the fruit that the Holy Spirit as we find here in Galatians chapter five, is endeavoring to produce, and he does it in various ways. So what is my, what does Paul say? Walk in the spirit. If I'm focused on walking in the spirit, what can I not do? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's one of those things that you can't do two things at once, and many people can do multiple tasks at once. But here we find spiritually we cannot. Either we're walking in the spirit or we're walking in the flesh. And if I'm walking in the spirit, I can't do the things of the flesh. And if I'm walking in the flesh, I most certainly cannot be walking in the spirit or having the fruit of the spirit evident in my life. It's, it's one or the other. And so as we look at a dependence, this Christian life is not one that we are to live on our own. God never designed it that way. What he designed is say, hey, son, listen, child, daughter, listen, I, you're, I, I'm calling you to this to the to a life that I want you to live, Ephesians 2.10, where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus on two good works. 
but it's it's not for you to live in your own strength. I want you to be depend, dependent upon me. I want you to trust me. I want you to rely on my strength, my power in your life. Number four, and lastly, uh, we look at development. Development. What do we mean by that? First John, I'll turn there and then I'll go to Ephesians chapter one. So, um, we can mark down Romans 8. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. What does God desire to do in your life? What does God desire to do in my life? To continually develop us. And I believe Romans 8 gives us that. We know that all things work together for good. Not that all things are good. When somebody gets that call with that terminalness. I wouldn't say that that's good that thing itself, or someone who loses the, uh, a child to death, or a, or a mate, or a family member, or a very close friend. I wouldn't say that that's good. Um, and we can rhyme off a number of things that we would say, well, I would consider that good. Look at that scripture. All things work together for good to them who are called according to his purpose, to, to who are, are loved of God. What is that good? All things work a little later on, verse 9 30, to conform me to the image of to produce the fruit in my life. God, my Father, your Heavenly Father, if you're a born again child of God, desires to make you to the image of His dear Son, to be like Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes He has you think, use things that are uncomfortable. But His desire is to produce fruit in our life, John 15, that you may bring forth much fruit, but to make you like the Lord Jesus Christ. So look at 1 John here, we find development. He desires to grow us. Uh, 1 John chapter one and verse number seven states this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. So walking in the light. Now, what does light do? Light does not make things appear in a room. For any of you who have Parents who've had children and leave toys about and so on, you walk through the house in the dark. My pretty much have my house memorized. I even have the church memorized. I've walked through the church in the pitch black and I know how many steps and turns and so on until somebody leaves a chair where I wasn't expecting or, you know, kid leaves a toy and you're barefoot and so on. <laughs> well, it makes for some interesting uh, uh, noises coming out of one's mouth uh, when that toe gets smashed or the shin gets hit or whatever. Light simply reveals what's in the room that is dark dark right so it expels the darkness and reveals so when we look at the scripture as we walk in the light as god reveals to us we're looking at growth and as we look at even our children as they grow and learn what do we want to do teach them more develop them more teach them more develop them more and so uh it's like learning the truth and obeying it i think james refers it to the to it the best is uh, not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. And related to a man who looks at a mirror, sees what kind of man he was, and then walks away and forgets everything. So looking in the mirror like, whoa, whoo, gotta do something about that hair, right? And walking away. No, what changed? Nothing changed. It, it, he saw, but nothing was, was done. He can't get angry at the mirror for revealing what place in front of the mirror. And many Christians get that way with the word of God. They get angry with God because it reveals the heart. So as we look at development, as we walk in the light, as we're growing, God wants to grow us and mature us and, and continue to cultivate in our lives. Ephesians chapter number one, uh, book of Ephesians chapter one is a beautiful chapter. As we look at who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ. Beautiful chapter. Ephesians, first three chapters about our position, and the, and the last three chapters, four, five, and six, is our practice or our living out uh, positionally. But look at chapter one, if you would, and uh, let's look at uh, beginning at uh, verse number 16. Paul talking about, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of in my prayers. Look at verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. What is What it was Paul's prayer? Paul's prayer was that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you unto you the spirit of wisdom, 
that you may, Paul saying, and that that you may learn and what may be revealed is the knowledge of Christ. Remember what Paul said, that I may know him. Paul says, I would be willing to give everything, let everything go, count everything but nothing if I could have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Paul's prayer is that God would give them wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Look at verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance uh, in the saints. What Paul's saying, oh, my prayer for you is, dear church at Ephesus, that you may have a, 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 you may develop, you may learn, grow in your knowledge of who God is, who your heavenly Father is, and a knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That was Paul's prayer, that they would develop, that they would learn, that they would grow in knowledge of, of him. In our balancing of the Christian life, if we are not continually learning who God is, what he is like in, in developing in our personal knowledge of him, we're going to become unbalanced. We're going to become unrooted, shall we say, and believe every wind of doctrine. But think of it as a child and a parent. The more they grow in their relationship together, the stronger it is, the sweeter it is. And there's this beautiful relationship that develops even into adulthood. Yes, the, you know, the adult child may not have to obey his parents, but there's this wonderful, wonderful relationship as it has developed and grown. That kind of relationship doesn't happen at birth between earthly parent and child, but has to be grown, has to cultivate and, and developed. And so God says, all things work together for God. I want to develop you. I want to grow you to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you may know him and grow in your knowledge of who I am, the Lord is saying. So as we look at being balanced, again, I'm taking a five, five or six week lesson and study and, and condensing it into, into just a few moments here. But as we look at our Christian life, as we look at it, we can become so unbalanced, focused in the wrong thing. And then it starts just throwing everything else out of sync. Remember that dedication. We are sanctified, set apart, we are temples of God, discipline. God does not do everything for us. He has, empowers us. He wants to use us. But there's responsibility that comes in, to us that we need to yield unto righteousness and be disciplined in our Christian life. And then independence. It's not, it's not in our own strength. God never intended it that way. He wanted us to be fully, 100% dependent upon him. And then, of course, in our development, God wants to grow us, wants to teach us. He wants to learn us for us to learn who he is and what he's like and for our relationship to, with him to grow. So my hope and prayer for you is that you are balanced. Maybe you got something out of balance. I would encourage you in your Bible reading just to grab a notebook and a pen and just to begin to jot things down that God brings out to you and, and look those and just jot those things down and over time look back and see the development and growth that God has done in your life. Let's pray. Shall we? Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, what a thought to be in Dryden preaching to a church in Marystown, Newfoundland. Um, but what a privilege. So we thank you for your word that you have given to us that which we need to be equipped, to be strengthened, to, to grow us, to challenge us. And Lord, uh, for you to show us how much you love us and how much you desire for us to get to know you. And uh, we thank you for that. We pray for the church, Heritage Baptist there, and uh, that you would continue to um, bless them. And as they navigate through these times, as uh, people are just uh, desirous to hear of things that are certain. And we know that your word is truth and uh, that you uh, love each one of us perfectly. And so we ask you, bless the rest of our evening, we ask and pray. We thank you for all that you've done. Amen. Well, thank you, church, for your, uh, the opportunity, Pastor Stanford, for this uh, time of preaching. I uh, certainly are grateful for it. Hey, thank you for taking the time, Pastor Leckman. It's, uh, I forgot about the whole camp thing. You were here a number of years ago. I'm preaching I was. Years, and uh, we had invited you. Uh, you kind of invited yourself, but it was okay. As you said, you were coming as a, a family vacation. And yes. 
Yeah. But, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed it didn't work out. We're, we're looking forward. This was going to be our 15th year of camp. Oh, man. Uh, so we'll have to wait till next summer to celebrate oh, that. But uh, hopefully we will get you out here again sometime. But thanks oh, no for time out of your week. And uh, if you think of it and you have the opportunity, send our gratitude to Emmanuel Baptist Church. We'll do so on Sunday. Thank you so much for supporting us. And uh, I appreciate what you and your family are doing up there. And uh, thanks for taking the time. So I'm going to sign off to everybody that's watching online. I'll let you know that Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we will be having a church service here in the building. And it will also be online. And Sunday night, we will not have a service in our building. My family and I are going on vacation. If I can get my act together between now and then, I'm going to pre-record a uh, uh, sermon and put it on there for the Sunday evening service, uh, but we will not have a church service here in the building this Sunday night or next Wednesday. For those of you that are here, we will not have youth hour next week or midweek because we'll be uh, away, but uh, Lord willing, I will also have a pre-recorded message for the Wednesday night uh, Bible study time. But uh, I want to thank you, uh, Pastor Leckman, for joining us tonight, and we're going to say goodbye to everybody online. And 